What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Sav Attack once again, and I finally got to play with a 7920X, which is the latest i9, or one of the latest i9 processors from Intel. I also got to play with the X299 motherboard and the chipset. In particular, I was using the ASRock X299 Tai Chi. I have lots of opinions about all of this, so I hope you guys will stay tuned. The numbers we're going to be talking about are all synthetic benchmarks, and I didn't actually have my camera equipment with me when I was testing, so all I really got was full screenshots of all of the completed benchmarks and maybe a couple pictures here and there. However, with all of that being said, let's talk about what I've discovered. Welcome back. So the first disclaimer before we get into this is that I only have one use case. So I haven't been able to test with multiple motherboards as well as I only have access to one processor and not anything but that processor. So nothing above that like the 7980XE or below that like the 7900X. So keep all of that in mind and take everything with a grain of salt. Moving on, the 7920X is a 12 core 24 thread processor. It sports a 2.9 gigahertz base clock with a boost of 4.3 gigahertz. It has a total of 16 and a half megabytes of L3 cache and that's going to be a little bit of a problem or my first problem with this processor as it were. So if we're talking about the competition AMD in this in this case we're talking about Threadripper and Threadripper has on it 32 megabytes of L3 cache. What does this mean? Well, if we're going to pick out a specific use case that I use a lot of my computer hardware for, I'm going to go ahead and pick mining. And in this case, if we we're going to take a look at Kryptonite or all of the different Kryptonite algorithms, you need for Kryptonite Lite one megabyte of cache per core that you decide to mine with. On Kryptonite, you need two megabytes of cache uh, per core that you want to mine with. And on Kryptonite Heavy, you need four megabytes of L3 cache per core to mine with. So in the case of the 7920X, it's not a very good miner. Even if you did Kryptonite Lite, you can't even utilize all the threads that are on that CPU. You can only use, well, 16, because you only have 16 megabytes of L3 cache. This can also affect other types of workloads, of course, and you just need to be made aware that if you're debating between the two platforms, forms that that's there. Moving on from that, those are all the specs. We're going to talk a little bit about the synthetic benchmarks, starting things off with Cinebench and a very particular test that actually sheds a lot of light on some of the reviews from maybe the bigger YouTubers and so on and so forth. And the discrepancy in the Cinebench scores, which I was able to go ahead and pin down. Luckily, I had about eight hours with this setup testing, so we have a lot of information as far as individual settings within the BIOS and so on. But starting things off, Cinebench with MCE off, which is MCE stands for multi-core enhancement, it scored only a 2503. Now keep in mind this processor is retailing for about $1,100 US and compared to the 32 thread 1950X from AMD, it actually scores significantly lower, at least with multi-core enhancement turned off. Now, if you turn multi-core enhancement on, you get a score of 2,855 in Cinebench. This is what I find super interesting because I think in most cases I saw a lot of reviewers getting the Gigabyte boards which would have the MCE turned on by default which would improve the Cinebench scores significantly. The other thing to note about this is with MCE off you're really not boosting all cores anywhere close to 4 gigahertz but you are on MCE hitting over the 4.3 advertised boost rate and hitting about 4.4 gigahertz which is very notable. So if you're looking at using one of these processors, in theory, you'd want multi-core enhancement turned on. But what was I testing for eight hours is the question you guys should be asking. And that was the stability of this platform. And what hindered the stability most of all? Well, multi-core enhancement. With multi-core enhancement turned on, anything that had any sort of small FFTs, or if you were in something like Ida64 and using FPU, you would have immediate blue screens or immediate shutoffs no matter what you did with multi-core enhancement on. So what that tells me is that it's pushing the chip too far and while it will work in daily tasks and probably not show too much issue all of the time, you'd probably get some reboots here and there, blue screens here and there, and then you'd move on your day 
and he'd get very good performance in single threaded operations of course and then show really good performance in th synthetic benchmarks I couldn't really recommend it because well it just is too unstable and if you're gonna have any sort of loads or doing any sort of serious rendering you're not going to be able to guarantee that you're going to get through that entire render without some sort of crash so the actual score for this particular cpu the 7920x in my opinion is going to be the former of a 2503 i don't think you can reasonably take a look at a consumer and advertise this product to have a cinebench score of above 2800 and I don't know if this is like I stated before this is a single use case if maybe the gigabyte boards don't have this issue or maybe the MSI boards don't have this issue and they apply multi-core enhancement and there ends up being no problem then okay let me know in the comment section below but I'm definitely noticing some serious issues here now one of the most impressive things which doesn't require you to turn multi-core enhancement on was the Cinebench single threaded score which was an impressive 194 and if you take a look at this this compared to pretty much anything else that's currently out it far surpasses it even the 8700k top scores are around 194 and all of these tests were done at stock clocks with stock bio settings and so on so to be able to plop a chip in that has 12 cores and 24 threads and get a single thread score this high is seriously impressive Moving on to CPU-Z, in the multi-threaded score, it got 7,662, while in the single thread, once again, beating pretty much everything out on, that's currently on the market, it had a 516. Seriously impressive stuff, believe me. So, next we had Geekbench 4, and Geekbench 4 is one of the benchmarks that would not complete no matter what you did with multi-core enhancement enabled. This is very important to note because it fails almost every single time. Actually, every single time it failed. I tried probably about five or six times and it would fail with multi-core enhancement turned on every single time. So these scores are without multi-core enhancement on and it had a single core score of 5140 with a multi-threaded score of 37523 now i did take a look at user bench and i'm not a big fan of this benchmark i don't know why everybody always asks for it so i provide it to y'all but i feel like it doesn't really give us any good comparisons and i don't think it's a very good benchmark in general however it was in the 66th percentile and you can see the screenshot for other details here once again performing really well in single threaded tasks but that's not really the whole story. Those are all the numbers. There is a lot of issues going on with this X299 chipset or and or the processor or the combination of the two. Whatever it is, it really aligns itself quite similarly to the initial launch of X299 with all the issues that they had there. And even I would relate it to the first generation of Ryzen right when it launched and a lot of the issues that we saw there or even that Raven Ridge CPU that released recently, the 2400G and 2200G. There are a lot of incompatibilities with different pieces of hardware. Uh, the chipset seems to have a ton of issues just in general. I mean, when I flashed it, for example, up to 2.0, which was the latest BIOS for that ASRock X299 Tai Chi, I went into the BIOS to review the settings and found that after the flash, without anybody touching anything, it changed the voltage to fixed mode and set that voltage within the red and that's a very alarming thing to see when you have a $1100 processor sitting in that motherboard and I definitely at this point would not recommend picking up the ASRock X299 Tai Chi as I even went ahead and said okay let's reset the default reboot see if it fixed it it didn't I had to manually change it back to auto or manually set the voltage to a safer limit. The next thing is, is I did go ahead and roll back the BIOS to 1.7 and to see if that BIOS was okay and didn't do the same thing. And wouldn't you know, if you go back in, it sets the voltage to fixed mode and sets it too high. 
The problem with that is I don't know if that is specifically limited to the X299 Tai Chi from ASRock or if they're seeing issues like that across the board. Now I do know that if you go ahead and enable multi-core enhancement, it pretty much will push that chip way past its TDP limits. So if you're going to be purchasing a cooler for this thing, it's almost impossible to enable multi-core enhancement and run anything that is not a custom cooling solution. You cannot run air coolers on this thing. I wouldn't recommend it if you're going to have multi-core enhancement enabled. Of course, if you turn that off, then yeah, sure, you can get away with it. With it off, you're looking at it sitting between 2.9 gigahertz and 3.2 gigahertz. It does not boost all cores very much at all if at all. In Ida64 over a long period of time it stayed stable at about 3 gigahertz on all cores with FPU enabled and got really really hot and so I'm just not seeing the appeal here. Now a few other things is when running those stability tests in with MCE off in Ida64 and CPU-Z the applications would frequently stop responding and in a couple cases did crash. So unfortunately, not all of the problems appeared to go away just by turning off multi-core enhancement. You will have kind of a lack of response within applications when trying to utilize all the cores. This could be due to cache. In fact, when I took a look at the dump files and went ahead and analyzed those, it did specifically say all of the crashes were due to CPU cache limitations or some sort of error within the CPU cache. I've tried with XMP profiles off and XMP profiles on. Of course, you see the memory tabs up in all of the benchmarks there. We are running the Corsair Vengeance RGB. It should be fine in this, in this setup. Obviously, we're having issues. The power that we were using, or the power supply, was the Corsair HX1200i. So it's a very high-end power supply. It should have no issues pushing the system, in theory. And I don't think we were experiencing that necessarily. Now, speaking to the motherboard itself, it's advertised to have plenty of power phases. It has 14 of them. It should be able to deliver plenty of power. One of the big things I noticed between the X299, or this particular one, and the ASRock Tai Chi X399, which I have my 1950X sitting in over here, is the lack of an additional 4-pin power. So there's actually a whole extra 4-pin CPU power over the X299. However, if you take a look at the numbers and the power draw on the CPUs, the the 7920X and the 7980XE are pulling just as much, if not more power, and are probably underrated on Intel sheets compared to what they're actually pulling as well. I wouldn't recommend using any kind of CPU cooler that doesn't have at least 300 watts of ability or capacity to to dispense that kind of that kind of power and i would be very very careful in investing in this platform at this point my suggestion would be going with an x99 platform something that's been had all the bugs worked out tons of bios releases and so on i had no problems with my x99 tai chi with the 6800k of course that cpu is a completely different beast in that one i have had issues with the x399 tai chi motherboard but mostly in pcie compatibility and those have all now been resolved well and audio don't get me started on the audio for the x399 it's messed up it doesn't work very well but that being said it doesn't crash on me all the time, right? The only thing that crashed on me ever with the X399 was when I was trying to use an Elgato capture card. Uh, and it was specifically only if I was trying to capture with the PCIe version of those capture cards and no other crashes were happening at any time. Seeing that I did all of these tests at the stock speeds on the 7920X and we are seeing frequent, frequent issues I'm really not going to recommend picking this up yet, especially for the price point. And when I went ahead and took a look online to see if I was, you know, the only one experiencing these problems, I quickly found articles even on Puget Systems talking about voltage issues and how it was pretty much overvolting everything 
uh, the dog out of everything even on a gigabyte Oris and they, they would have to go in there and set it to fixed and even when they did that they had issues with crashing and even if you enabled AVX and down and down bolted and under bolted you were still having issues there and there are just threads upon threads of anybody that actually had the the money to go ahead and be able to afford it I am going to say like you'd really really want to have Intel to go for this multi-threaded option from them over the current Ryzen offerings with Threadripper and I think you guys know that I've been hard on all of the companies so don't don't go into that we're going to stick we're going to stick and keep it friendly a discussion of the issues that people are having in the comment section if you are having issues with you know X399 I I'd like to hear about those as well but this is where I stand so far on the current offerings for the multi-threaded beasts from both blue and red I think if you have to choose something right now that you're going to go with Threadripper. I don't think you personally need it in most compute cycles and I would recommend bumping down to either Z370 or X370. The only appeal here is the amount of cores and the high single threaded performance on these processors from Intel. It's seriously impressive. I just hope they can get all the bugs worked out and you can get some form of 24-7 stability. Hope this video was helpful. If it was, leave a like, comment, and I will see you next Tuesday.